So I'm talking to this professor over at Tulane, and she's telling me that I can take you from the wellhead to the top of the water and then through the process, and then maybe go out for some questions. But what happened when the well broke, when it broke at the wellhead? You have a mile between the bottom of the ocean and the top of the ocean. And that oil is getting scrubbed through seawater because it's lighter than water. The oil is just rushing to the top of the gulf. The whole way, it's being naturally dispersed. It's being scrubbed down like it's in your kitchen sink. Not with Dawn or anything that's removing some of the volatiles, but the ocean itself is removing the volatiles. And then when it gets to the top of the water, in 104 degree temps with the sun beating down, a lot of that stuff burns off. So immediately you have nature starting to disperse the stuff naturally. And then once they figured out what was happening, BP put in the dispersants right at the wellhead. So then you have the ocean working on it the whole way to the top, and dispersants being injected into the flow of oil to break it down further. And right now the reports are that, oh, there are plumes of oil across the bottom of the ocean or in the middle of the ocean. It's very misleading because you say that to someone and they think, oh, it's just thick black oil in the middle of the Gulf. And it's not. If you or I swam through it right now, you wouldn't feel it on your body, you wouldn't see it, you wouldn't be able to taste it, you wouldn't be able to tell that it's oil. But from a scientist's point of view, oil that's been dispersed and broken down to microscopic levels is still oil. So there's a disconnect between what the media is saying about, oh, there are plumes of oil in the Gulf, and what we as just regular humans can see as damage. What the toxicologist said over at Tulane was that we don't know yet what's going to happen with this stuff. The oil is there in the water, or what used to be oil is there in the water, and it probably is going to drop to the bottom. And different types of animal and living beings in the water are going to eat it, and they're going to get eaten by something else, and they're going to get eaten by something else, and maybe it will <coughs> work its way up the food chain, and who knows if it'll be toxic at some point, but every test they've done, and they've done thousands and thousands of tests, have shown that nothing's at a toxic level. Even when they go through this area that has the dispersed oil, even when they go through, even people from Woods Hole were measuring it and saying, okay, we can measure that it's there. But the levels they're measuring it at are parts per billion, just like very minuscule. So there's a, a disparate view between what the damage is there and what the perception is. With the signs up in New York restaurants saying, oh, we don't serve golf. Gulf seafood. It's like, how how can you damage a region more than that? Because there, I think there are three main income draws in the Gulf region are oil, seafood, and tourism. So, so they were going to do a moratorium on drilling, which I guess has not happened. The seafood, if people around the U.S. aren't buying it, that's been damaged, and tourism certainly is. Except for when I was in New Orleans, it was hopping the whole time. You had lines of restaurants, people were still going out. They're 50 miles from the coast, which again is something that people don't realize. They, if they haven't been to New Orleans, they think, oh, New Orleans, right there. They, they were covered in water during Katrina, so they must be right on the Gulf. They're not. It's 50 miles. It's two hours of driving back Podunk Roads to get to the shore. So it's far away from the water. They do have a lake on the side. They have the Mississippi there, and with the uh, storm swell and everything like that, storm surge and everything like that, that's what happened with Katrina. That's why they were inundated and just flooded out. But the oil wasn't slapping up on Bourbon Street by any stretch. So. Did, you, did you talk to any scientists about the long-term implications of this on the fishing industry in particular? Well, that's the main thing. The, the shrimp and oysters are probably the the food sources that are going to be most affected. But it's still a wait and see. It's a, we don't know what's going to happen yet until we study this stuff down the road. And I've heard of studies being done on the, uh, I think there's a 20 year study from an oil spill, and I don't know the location, so I'm sorry about that, of just the implication on the, the sea or the shellfish in the whole life cycle, but I don't know where this was done, and they're still tracking it. And I don't know if it was Woods Hole people that were doing the study. And they say, okay, it's built up in animals and you can still measure it, but I don't know how toxic it is. I, I wish I knew more 
in that realm. A lot of the people I talked to were real estate pros and people who were trying to measure the impact on how do you evaluate a property if the perception is that it has no value anymore? How do you run a business if you're a sport fishing and hunting business that sells stuff to people who go out into the Gulf and you're banned from taking your boat into the Gulf and you can't bring people out there to sport fish because the fishery and wildlife and the, the Coast Guard and everyone says, no, you can't be out here because it's not safe for fishing. Your business is ruined right there. So talk to some insurance people who told us what certain things people have to look for. Talk to lawyers who were saying, well, okay, do you get interruption of uh, business or viability insurance? And then do you have a suit against someone that has interrupted your livelihood? And there are so many things to be decided. One of the other things that the toxicologist told me that I wasn't aware of was that during Katrina, which is still a huge mess down there, people don't realize that either, is that during Katrina, a ton of oil wells were knocked over. And they were just pumping oil into the Gulf the whole time Katrina was going on. No one even focused on that, not that they should have. I mean, you have people hanging out on roofs and dying in the Superdome and all that, but you had a handful of wells, not just one well, that were just snapped off because of the storm. And they were pumping their oil into the Gulf, and the Gulf has bounced back from that, at least until this. So that's where we stand right now. The, the most interesting thing for me was that there was no magic bullet here. You know, there were a lot of people out there, even Kevin Bacon came out and said, you know, I can fix this. Or, Kevin Bacon, right? You know, a lot of people out there with technology ideas, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts with people that came in and said, oh, well, you need to do, you know, this great big, you know, concept and roll this out, this is how you can roll it out. Did right. you see any of this technology? I didn't see the technology. I heard about it while I was down there. The trouble is that the trouble is there's too much technology, which there are two, two points I'll make with that. One, the news we get nowadays is instant. So people can be hanging around with a flip cam and take a video of a, a seal floating up on the shore or a seagull or a pelican or something covered with oil and instantly everyone around the world sees it. So they, they get into a flurry of panic and worry that, well, what else is going on? And then all the news organizations grab hold of that and say, well, let's go down and let's find the story. And they've predetermined what they want to find. So they're going down there. And again, one of the best quotes from this Tulane toxicologist was that she said the news organizations came down hoping for another Exxon Valdez where they could see a tidal wave of oil just splashing up on the uh, estuaries. And that's not how it was. Even when you get down to the shore, you're still 50 miles from the well. So you're not going to see this oil piling in on top. And all they did was focus their cameras on the water and wait. And it's like, come on. So when they found one area that may have been affected by a lot of oil and was visually impactful, they all swarmed to that and looked at it. And I'll tell you, I drove hours and hours up and down the coast, walking the beaches, getting kicked off the beaches because the, the people cleaning didn't want me there with the video camera or anything, digging around. And I took 400 photos, not one tarball. And I saw bags of oil in the decontamination zones and in the dumpsters and different areas, but I was not able to see anything in the wild. I wasn't able to touch this stuff. And people I talked to who were working the cleanup, they were being replaced when I was finishing my tenure down. They were being replaced and BP was bringing in almost like a, uh, just a maintenance crew just a smaller crew to take care of all the cleanup that went on. And there were, there were stories down there of when Obama went down to see what was going on, of uh, busloads of workers coming down like 10 minutes before Obama showed up, cleaning the beach and working the beach and just hanging out there, having him walk the beach and see how clean it was and see that everyone was working to make the place clean. He'd hop back in like, I don't know what it's called, it's not Air Force One, but you probably came across SUV One or whatever it is, <laughs> drive away, and then all the workers are piled back in the buses and sent back to whatever they were doing. But it really wasn't a sham, it wasn't a show, because here I am, just Jeff Cutler, hanging out on the beaches on the Gulf Coast, and uh, I saw the people working, and was talking to them and taking photos, and 
they were all just doing their job, and the amount of oil that was coming in was dwindling, either based on the currents in the Gulf, which are spinning counterclockwise, and you would think they're headed to Texas, but when they get close to the shore, they switch the other way and head towards Florida. So as I get into the coast, they move back towards the Panhandle. Um, just stuff that I learned from being at the aquarium and from talking to people down there. Um, but the beaches were great. It was, I don't know, it was surprising to me too. It was nice to be able to provide that information off because news outlets, you get, I got yelled at by uh, NBC New York because I was down at the estuary, at the edge of the water, 50 miles from the, the well, trying to listen in on an interview with one of the parish presidents, or parish, uh, yeah, parish president, who was very vocal. And this was Billy Nungesser. And I had my own interview with him. I had my own time, own private time with him. But NBC was doing their live shot at the edge of the pier. And a ton of us freelancers were down there, and we were like holding our microphones out, and their producer was coming around kicking at us and telling us to move away. And it's like, dude, we're out in, in public, and he's not going to tell you anything different than he's going to tell us. And it's not like I'm competing with you. Let me get, get some information so I know what to ask when I go to my, uh, my shoot. So it was fun.